Hi, and welcome to New God Sunday School. I'm Tom Scholey, author of Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the King of Comics. So here's Captain Victory, issue 12. Origin 2, end of the boy, beginning of the man, in defense of our galaxy, Captain Victory and the Galactic Rangers. And so, yeah, this is the second part of the Captain Victory origin story, the one that ties Captain Victory's background to the new gods and you know, whatever happened to the new gods. You know, they they the series ended in the 70s and now it's the 80s and Jack Kirby had more story to tell. And so he's using this uh, as a means to do it. And this is before he created uh, Hunger Dogs and all those other ones at DC. And there is some speculation that uh, maybe, you know, DC saw these comics and that, uh, helped their decision to, um, you know, have Kirby come back to DC and, and finish the series. Great cover. The heroes are just under attack. Arrows are flying. Captain Victory is throwing this, like, cool sci-fi grenade. And then we have a new character, Captain Argus Flane, which uh, is a really nice design. This late in Kirby's career, he's created, like, a really unique but but iconic character. I mean, Argus Flane, you could put up there with some of his great characters. And he might even be uh, the, the newest incarnation of one of his great characters, but we'll get to that soon. Origin 2 of Captain Victory and his Galactic Rangers, growing up with the Lost Ranger. You've come to bid me farewell, young friend. Yes, too, Ray. Created, written, and drawn by Jack Kirby, inked by Michael Thibodeau. Colors by Tom Luth, lettering by Pally Jensen. This is a really great splash page. And, I mean, these guys sure look like the sort of flunkies you'd see on Apocalypse in an issue of Mr. Miracle or New Gods. And I gotta say, in Captain Victory, there's the first couple issues that are inked by Mike Royer, and, and to me, they just look spectacular. Now, um, in, in talking about this series, I kind of sped through a bunch of issues uh, in this video series. A big part of that is because I'm not a huge fan of Mike Thibodeau's inking on this series. And, and for me, it it detracts from my enjoyment of it. And, and Jack Kirby, in a lot of ways, was inker-proof, but I, I just don't really enjoy it that much. Now, uh, in Mike Thibodeau's defense, he is a talented artist. He, like, if you look at his um, airbrush work, his, you know, his own work, he does, he's, he's an extremely talented artist. Uh, it's just being Jack Kirby's inker is a very different kind of job. It's a very demanding task, and most people are not up to the challenge. Uh, but we're fortunate to have these you know, people who've become known and associated with Jack Kirby who just, you know, for various reasons, you know, rise to the occasion and are and are just sort of, you know, built for that. So people like Joe Sinnott, uh, Mike Royer, uh, Wally Wood, uh, you know, uh, um, Chick Stone. I mean, too many to name. It, Vinnie Coletta, the controversial Vinnie Coletta. Um, Still, he was up to the challenge, and he had to cut a lot of corners and things like that. But he he still, you know, delivered a a, a really you know pleasing aesthetic uh, to to the inking of Jack Kirby's pencils. You know, in my opinion, Mike Thibodeau didn't. But as the series goes on, he's you know putting in these hours, and he does get better and better and better. And so by the time we get to this issue, I, I think these ink, inks are really good. Like I I think. Uh, you know, if this is what the inking looked like in Mike Thibodeau's first issue, we'd be in good shape. And the fact that the comic gets really, really good right around here helps. So, um, and, and this issue of Captain Victory is another one I would, you know, put up there with, you know, some of Kirby's greats. Not as high as like, the absolute peak of the mountain kind of stuff that, that he was doing in the middle of, you know, New Gods and, and those series. But it's it's up there. Like, it's pretty great. And so here's two, Ray. Committing an act of virtue on a world of evil is a capital crime. You're to be executed or exiled, young friend. I'll always remember that you were here too, Ray, thus lessening my pain. I'm ready now friend to a giant computer. It's uncanny. And 
I mentioned this in the previous episode, Toure seems to be an evolution of the mother box, like a, like a mother box just kept growing and growing and growing and became this giant supercomputer. And Teru was the magic word that um, the forever people would speak to their mother box. Toure seems like, you know, an inversion of that. And if I didn't note it, I mean, what a beautiful double page splash. It's, you know, Kirby would do these great um, paintings that were just techno landscapes. It was just sort of like, you know, technology that, that just has grown and, and taken over a landscape. This is firmly within that body of work, but those paintings were, uh, you know, purely, you know, paintings. They were, they were visual statements meant to stand alone, but I love it when Kirby takes that aesthetic and makes it part of a story, makes it, you know, part of a continuity. And so this, this is a, a real treat. And the color, I love the way the color is handled here. You know, think about how, you know, most people would approach something like this and color it, you know, maybe a lot of grays and, but this, it's like, there's a bunch of different colors, some, you know, pretty different from each other, uh, yet there's a real harmony here and, and it's just really beautiful. Another thing I'll say about this series, it, it's got some really great color and it's got experimental color too. They're, like people are taking chances. And Tom Luth here, he really has mastery of that color wheel. He, he understands color theory. The, the thing that Captain Victory says about this machine, about Toure saying that you lessened my pain, it also makes me think of the mother box because the mother box was, you know, could be among other things, a calming agent to the new gods. It lessens your pain. It, it uh, can, you know, heal your wounds, um, maybe, maybe only temporarily, but uh, it, it can heal your wounds. It can uh, lessen your emotional pain. It can calm you down. You know, Orion used it for that a lot. It would soothe you. A lot of people have made the comparison of Jack Kirby's mother box, that Jack Kirby's mother box was uh, you know, the first smartphone, because uh, people, I think people relate to their phones in a similar way. Initiate phase one, I'll take care of your escort. So phase one, okay, there, there's a plan going on here, and that's a great panel. That's a, that's a classic Jack Kirby panel. That, you know, Kirby's drawing this in the 80s. Those really great Mike Royer inked issues, he was drawing in the 70s. So they kind they're, so they're like really, really, you know, prime Kirby, because they're, you know, he made them you know, around the same time he was doing things like, you know, the Eternals and Devil Dinosaur. So it's, it's, it's got that aesthetic. By the 80s, his, his aesthetic had changed a little bit. His drawing style had gotten a little bit looser. But I mean, this panel right here could be from the 70s, could be from the 60s, but it's from the 80s. Two rays struck and the young man ran. Their secret plan was in action and each knew well what the fate of the other would be. So yeah, they do have a secret plan. Then, Black Mass. Let me tell you, this, this is the panel this, th that blows my mind. And this is where, up to this point, you could say this whole, you know, connection to Jack Kirby's New Gods. Uh, it's a fan theory. You know, maybe it's a little bit of a stretch. But that silhouette, look at those boots. Look at the helmet. Look at that, like, tunic. Look at the gloves. That's dark side. Jack Kirby is drawing dark side silhouette. And Black Mass, what a name. Again, sounds like Black Sabbath or some, you know, some unholy, you know, satanic version of the mass. But, I mean, Black Mass to me is one, I mean, Dark Side is one of Jack Kirby's great creations. Black Mass, just in his own, even though Black Mass is the ghost of Dark Side. Uh, Black Mass in his own right is a pretty great creation. That's a great name. And in the previous issue, Black Mass's family referred to him as Father Black Mass, which is just really great because it's kind of like almost like a pun, like Father Christmas or something, the evil version of Father Christmas. But then the name is also great because he is a mass of black. He is, you know, black ink applied to a piece of paper. I love the way Kirby does shadows, the way he spots black. You know, he's got his own way of doing it that, that nobody else could do. You know, uniquely his own. He, he, he puts it into these abstract shapes 
that like I'm not sure how he got there, how he figured these out, but they're they're beautiful and they're perfect. Uh, you know, Ed Pisker would say to me like when I would do a drawing where I was trying to emulate Jack Kirby's style. Ed would say to me, you know, you've you've got pretty much all the elements of Jack Kirby. The one thing I've I've never seen in your work is the way Jack Kirby spots black. Jack Kirby, he's got his own way of doing it. Nobody else does it that way, and it's just so great. And um, and I've just never like I've never seen you do that in your work. And it's not for lack of trying. I tried, but yeah, it it is really hard to to pull that part off. And I thought that was very smart of it. I, th I thought that was like a really good note. And I don't know how many people on planet Earth would be able to pick up on something like that. So I felt very fortunate to know somebody who could. Great black mass terrified you until you realized he was all shadow without substance. No, grandfather, no. Another great panel. Welp, how like your father you are. A feisty, rebellious, arrogant warrior who delighted in tearing up my dreams. <laughs> uh, you know, if, if you're a father, you can relate to that line uh, of, uh, you know, you got all your stuff all lined up, you got things just the way you want it, and then, you know, your your uh, child comes along and uh, all of a sudden it's it's just a mess on the floor. It's, it's uh, you know, torn up and, and scattered in every direction. I'm sure this happened to Jack Kirby. I'm sure one of his children, as much as he loves them, and, uh, you know, his relationship with his children was not like Darkseid's relationship with his children. But uh, I'm sure he had moments where one of the kids ran in the room, tore up a page of Captain America or something, and he lost his shit. He was the wheel horse for my enemies, a traitor to his own blood, like you. This, uh, that line, I, I think of that line often the wheel horse for my enemies. And it's interesting thinking of, you know, Darkseid's life, you know, and, and thinking of it from his perspective. I don't think we've ever heard him, you know, talk about Orion quite in this way before. But of course, you know, as he's scolding his rebellious grandchild, you know, the, the, these these things are gonna come out. And yeah, and, and how, like, I mean, you know, fuck Darkseid, you know, he's, he's a cosmic asshole. But, uh, you know, you still kind of feel for him a little bit that his, you know, his son uh, turned against him, joined up with, you know, his enemies and was the guy in the lead in, you know, taking down Darkseid's empire. You know, I could list a million reasons why, hey, Darkseid, you reap what you sow. And I mean, and he's the one who handed his son over to his enemies. So he had to have some inkling that that was a possibility. But uh, Jack Kirby... Greatest artist of the 20th century. You know, no argument there. But greatest writer of the century? Greatest writer of the 20th century? Could be, could be. This is this is great stuff. This is great writing. And when you look at it in the context of, you know, the other works that this is connected to, what a beautiful panorama. And you, you're just a voice. Once fat with power, you finally used it to stay alive in this shabby manner. Well, I'll have nothing of what happened here or what may happen here. So yeah, Darkseid used his power to somehow stay alive in this shabby manner, this much reduced manner. He's still a presence. He still wields a certain amount of power, but he sure ain't what he used to be. I guess we'll never know exactly how he, he, he ended up this way or what he did or uh, the circumstances would make it would make a great story, and if uh, you know Jack Kirby had gotten the opportunity to tell that story, that that would have been spectacular. But there was a sort of Promethean giant that looked a lot like Darkseid in a previous issue of Captain Victory, which we talked about, and you know maybe he was doing some kind of uh, like those Promethean giants from New Gods number five. Maybe he was trying to engulf the source, you know, swallow the source, devour the source in a similar way, ended up like one of them, ended up, you know, just this this uh, cosmic uh, galaxy-sized carcass, and then this is this is what became of his essence. And it does it does remind me of Lord of the Rings and the Silmarillion. If you read those, um, there are enemies like Melkor, who is basically the Satan figure 
of Middle Earth, of of Tolkien's mythology, and and then also like the more famous Sauron, who was a disciple of Melkor and uh, became you know sort of like the Satan of you know like modern Middle Earth of of like the Middle Earth we know from the Lord of the Rings stories. It was a similar thing where they would start out very powerful, very beautiful, and then they would be killed. And each time they would be killed, they would lose something. They'd lose some beauty. They'd lose some power and um, and then come back in, in, a, in a reduced form. And it would go on and on throughout the generations until eventually when Sauron was finally defeated at the end of uh, Lord of the Rings, he still existed as a shadow. He was a shadow. He was a, he was a ghost that would, you know, live in sort of the darkest parts of the darkest forests of Middle Earth, and and uh, he couldn't physically hurt anybody, but he could, you know, whisper some some evil shit in your ear and uh, and maybe convince you to do something awful, which is, um, you know, what Black Mass is, you know, doing in 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 these two issues he's he's commanding an army but he still needs big ugly and he needs uh, captain victory whose whose name up to this point hasn't been said we don't know his name this part of the cosmos is poisoned by its past and cursed by your presence in the darkness of the techno room i found the machine produced by two ray a computer with standards greater than its builders and my friend to the last and that was also the impression that you'd get of the mother boxes in new gods that uh, the mother boxes were better that the the gods of apocalypse had were better than than their makers than the people that built them that somebody like slig is just this like awful you know horrible guy who uh you know takes nice uh, sea creatures and turns them into uh, destructive mutants, but his mother box loved him. His mother box really cared about him in a real way, and and was you know incredibly sad and anguished when when Orion hurt Slig, and 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 Orion eventually murders Slig's mother box, and it's one of the more disturbing moments in the series uh, to watch the hero, you know, gleefully kill a computer that wh whose only sin or only crime was love, was loving its uh, creator or, or its user. I found it too, Ray. Then prepare to leave. This room dissolves when the machine is launched. Hang on and good luck. Now hold on for this. Hold on to your hats. Another Jack Kirby double page splash. Basically a universe Toure's work was apocalyptic in nature. Interesting choice of word. Apocalyptic for uh, what's going on right now involving what, what we believe is the planet Apocalypse. During those last moments, he struck with a mammoth force, which not only destroyed him, but twisted and battered time and space in manners unheard of, equations conceived by great minds in our past. Toure has done something apocalyptic, which has destroyed him, destroyed Toure, but twisted and battered time and space in manners unheard of. You know, maybe the anti-life equation, maybe, I mean, it says equation, so maybe similar related e equations, equations just as powerful, but maybe, uh, you know, different in nature. But he's basically doing something extremely destructive. And and to me, it's the twisting and battering of time and space that um, this dimension where the gods reside, it's it's called you know dimension x or, or it's got uh, quadrant x it's called quadrant x is a separate part of time and space this uh, area of the gods is separate separate from the time and space we live in and and perhaps this is how that happened that that two ray created you know destroyed itself and and completely cut off quadrant x from the rest of the universe you know kind of uh quarantining Black Mass, Dark Side, and 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 his conquest from the rest of the universe. You know, keeping the rest of the universe safe. And this was this was you know the the big part of this plan that Toure and uh, Captain Victory were working on in secret. Again, we don't we don't know his real name. But look at this. What he's riding on looks a lot like Orion's astro harness, his astro force equipment. Um, you know, and 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 this this image lines up really nicely with the image where we see the first appearance of Orion, 
with sort of, you know, sort of cosmic destruction behind him. And, and you know, starting with the old, the epilogue of the old gods and their world was destroyed and forever changed. And then you see like uh, 2001, A Space Odyssey, you see a jump cut of, you know, billions of years, maybe more to Orion sort of flying through, you know, a cosmic destruction. Here we have, you know, this cosmic destruction going on and Orion's sun riding a, a similar device. There was little time to reflect upon anything. I had time for one brief glance over my shoulder, a final look at the victim of once angry giants, my home planet, Helicost. And so there it is, Helicost. And the coloring is a little, a little off here, the way I think the colorist interpreted what was going on. It's, it's a complicated drawing that Kirby's doing, but basically what he's drawing is a planet that is basically cut in half, or maybe even less than half. It's kind of like cleaved down. And this, this is the flat, this is what the cleaved, what the cut is. So this is like the flat part. You know, if you're thinking of this as like a geode or something, this is the flat part. And then this is, you know, the rest of the planet sort of round. And in the center of it is this fire pit, like the fire pits of apocalypse, because this is apocalypse. This is, this is what's left of apocalypse, that somehow apocalypse got destroyed, and, and Holocaust, again, Black Mass, if, if you're not allowed to use the, the name Dark Side, Black Mass is a hell of a replacement, maybe, maybe even a little bit better. Maybe, you know, kind of like a, a PG-13 version of Dark Side. And Holocaust is great too. You can't say Apocalypse, so you come up with Holocaust. It does the job. And, and again, just like Dark Side, um, just like Black Mass, Holocaust might be a better name than apocalypse, but in any event, it's it's great. And and at this point, you can't you can't mistake what Jack Kirby's doing here. You know, this is New Gods. But again, well within uh, the bounds of copyright law he, and and trademark, he's not infringing on anybody's anything. But we know what he's doing. If if you know Jack Kirby and you love Jack Kirby and you love the New Gods, at this point, it, it couldn't be more obvious what he's doing. I viewed it from its bottom side its last flaming energy pit still feeding what was left of the triumph of evil against the forces of virtue. From that kind of war, not even names survived. Thus, Holocaust and those upon it were false in name as well as word. So now he's making canonical, making it part of the story why Darkseid isn't called Darkseid. That this war was so destructive and final that, that even the names were forgotten. So, so uh, you know, if he were doing this at DC, you know, maybe he maybe he wouldn't be using Dark Side there either. At this point in the history, it's it, and it's it's I mean, really great stuff, really like apocalyptic, biblical, you know, just uh, just amazing. Again, amazing writing, and we never find out Captain Victory's name in this series other than Captain Victory. Like that's part of it too. That's an energy pit, the last one. This is. Apocalypse in a much reduced form. Apocalypse, post-apocalypse. It ain't what it used to be. Um, and yeah, this this one last, you know, fire pit that doesn't, you know, doesn't blaze away like the ones did in, in Apocalypse's glory days. It was the, the triumph of evil against the forces of virtue. So apparently Apocalypse won the war, the war that we saw in New Gods. Apocalypse won that war, but not without you know, paying a price, not without its planet being destroyed. And and when Jack does eventually do the end of the war uh, in, in Hunger Dogs, the, uh, this exact thing doesn't happen, but something similar. Uh, uh, New Genesis gets destroyed. And I, again, you know, watch that episode, you know, to find out more. But um, New Genesis is destroyed. And then, and then a reign of the fragments of New Genesis reigns on Apocalypse. So, you know, not, not the exact thing, but, but something similar. Obviously, you know, Jack was, you know, had some, some idea of what, you know, what he envisioned, you know, being the final days of that war. Not even a massive computer like Turei could resurrect the true names of those who fought in the war. Yet he fashioned this cosmic craft from a design known to my own father. So, yeah, this is, Turei has improvised a, an, a you know, a space glider to the best of his ability, based on the designs of Captain Victory's father, Orion, 
and it looks a lot like Orion's. It doesn't look exactly like Orion's, but it looks a lot like it. But, uh, you know, Toure did a pretty good job. It, it, every panel of this is just so great. Cosmos, I don't even know his name. He doesn't know the name of his own father, and he can't because because of, you know, the, the destruction of that universe and, and because of uh, copyright law. And yeah, what, you know, and what a painful thing for this, you know, child to walk around with that, that um, you know, he never knew, it, never knew his dad's name. Well, it's Orion. And, and that, that works with the rest of the New God stuff. Scott Free, Mr. Miracle, never knew his own real name because Scott Free was, you know, this, uh, this joke name that Granny Goodness gave him, but his parents gave him, a, you know, uh, gave him a name before that, but, but he, he, he never knew it. And he never, know, he never knew his mom's name. You know, she died, she died when he was an infant. Uh, Avia. So there, you know, George Lucas would talk about the sort of uh, echoes and, and the poetry of the, the the various trilogies of Star Wars and 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 how you know they all sort of you know echo each other and 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 it rhymes. You know, for Jack Kirby, that's it's it seems like that's even more so. Loneliness overtook me. The universe I'd known was closing in galactic tremors. It was a narrowing slash of light that would momentarily be swallowed by a night without stars. That universe is sort of you know closing off, which is how we see Quadrant X in, in the issues that lead up to this, that it's this like cosmic eye that sort of opens up and then, you know, you can, you can see into another universe and then it closes back up again. The night set in and continued endlessly, it seemed. I held on grimly to my machine, knowing that light years were rushing by. After an age had passed, I saw it, a single planet circling a weak sun in a vast sea of darkness. Naturally, I took my cue. I've seen them bigger and brighter, but for a little squirt of a planet, you don't look bad at all. Nature's laid a very kind hand upon this place. Pow! Somebody down here doesn't like me, and it sounds like they're warming up for another hit. Cosmos. Wham! Talk about unexpected welcomes. That was a beauty. Those mini-missiles came from behind me. Wonder who my neighbors are. They were still behind me and I found out, but my discovery was to be short-lived. The following blow-up was a frontal wallop. I was in a sort of no man's land. Relax that trigger, whoever you are. I'm on no one's side but my own. True enough, lad, you hardly look like a mechano to Captain Argus Flane. I don't know how many times Jack Kirby's done this. This is, this is not part of Kirby's regular bag of tricks, these tall, thin panels. But it was sort of, uh, you know, a fashionable thing in... Uh, the late 70s, early 80s, you see Frank Miller do this a lot. And yeah, Kirby, Kirby's rocking it. He's doing great. For a second, Captain Victory is colored like Orion with uh, orange hair and a red shirt. And yeah, Argus Flame, that's, you know, pretty cool. Uh, again, those like deep sh shadows, the, the spotting of black the way, um, you know, only Jack Kirby can do. And there he is revealed. Flane was obviously some kind of eccentric character who didn't seem native to that planet and was apparently uninterested in socializing with those who were. What in cosmos are you doing here? That same question has suddenly become very intriguing to me, Captain Flane. And look at this outfit. This is great. I mean, this, this guy can, could, could go on to, to star in his own comic. I love the earth tones, too. It does. Uh, he's got all the Kirby tech, but then the earth tones... You know, he could fit right into Star Wars, too. And, and man, the eye patch. Uh, you know, maybe Kirby just saw Escape from New York. Uh, but, yeah, what a great look. That is a super fucking cool-looking character. Kind of looks like Thingbeard. I mean, he's uh, Captain Argus Flane, with, with the way his dialogue's written in his name, he, he seems like he's supposed to be sort of like a space pirate. Salty old sea dog of the stars. As I turned to face my newfound acquaintance, I knew this planet had a grave problem. My newfound acquaintance. This area looks like a battlefield to me. It certainly is, lad. Been this way since I landed on this planet. Yeah, the, <laughs> I like that this planet has a big problem. This guy. But surely you seem capable of working something out with the natives. They love me, lad. We get along just fine. I hate to mention this, but the facts seem contrary to your statement. Smart little buggers. Their mini-missiles are achieving more accuracy and bang. Crafty little wizards, they're far-out wonders when they work with metal gadgetry. They're primitives who have a hunger for technological creativity. And I'm beginning to realize who's exploiting that hunger. And this reference to eccentric 
character. Keep that in mind because that's how, you know, Jack Kirby would describe, you know, the, 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 the people of Apocalypse or whatever. There are theories that this guy is, you know, connect, is possibly also one of the new gods, but, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Look, lad, would you believe it? I can't drive them off. I simply plant a gadget and they return. And so you get an, another piece of like beautiful uh, Kirby God tech here, just, just looks great. And, you know, reminds me of, um, you know, that ancient statue um, and then Kirby just sort of extrapolating off of that, you know, just something, you know, from, from, from the recesses of, of the human experience. They'd ignore any danger to get their hands on it. Naturally, the thing is booby-trapped. You're a nasty old humanoid, Captain. Why do you indulge in this sort of thing? They're shaken up a bit, lad. Not enough charge to hurt them. Frustrates them, though. Gets them angry. Gets them fit to wipe out a regiment of Captain Flames. Cosmos, you want them to kill you. Look at this area. It's been worked over, churned up and seared by very deadly weapons. They want your hide, Captain. True enough, it's the last one I've got, and it's getting older all the time. But it's kept alive by anger, the will to fight. So this anger will spread until a simple natural people who live in harmony with their beautiful planet turn it into a burning dung heap to help you die in battle. What a noble hero you are. Captain Flane is antagonizing uh, the people that live on this planet with uh, ever escalating technology to get them to improve their technology to sort of, you know, help with help him with his, his death wish, like Captain Turpin's death wish. It seems to be bearing fruit. The counterattack came, of course, and this game of death continued with growing ferocity as the years passed by. When I was 18 years old, the primitives now wore armor and attacked with more effective weaponry. When I became 21, they barreled in with aircraft and the beginnings of sophisticated electronic war. This is, I mean, this is Kirby doing a sci-fi story. Like Kirby does great sci-fi stories, but this is like real sci-fi, not, I mean, it's, he, he's folded it into a space opera epic, but this, this whole concept and thing, this, this is, this is as sci-fi as sci-fi gets. Captain Flane is violating the prime directive, uh, guiding the technological evolution of this planet with his own experiments, his own uh, evil experiments. Our hut in the shape of the Universal Pyramid still stood, but the field of devastation had widened and formed an ever-enlarging blotch on the face of paradise. That, that uh, Universal Pyramid is a motif that you'll see in, in Kirby's work, and I, I try to note it where I can in these videos. And notice, uh, you know, you have this, this paradise that, that the presence of Argus Flame is, is making it turn into a dung heap. A little by little turning new genesis into apocalypse, you know, pitted with, with uh, you know, massive holes in the surface. Below the pyramid, the captain and I easily survived in quarters undreamed of by his enemies. It's time for you to leave. My old ranger uniform fits you well. I trust you'll keep our pact. The pact, you know, pacts were very important in the new gods. Yes, I shall find ranger center and join the corps. Yeah, you join the corps and I stop the war. Kind of rhymes, doesn't it? Come with me. There's nothing left here for you. But I am coming with you. Each time you're promoted, I shall be there. And when you finally command a galactic dreadnought, I shall be there at your side. They'll give you 50 clones of yourself and a code name. Remember the code name. Captain Victory, I shall demand it. We've learned from each other, respected each other's wishes. Now take off. Thus I leave, Captain. Just looking at Captain Flane's face and the way it turns into this, you know, mask, this monstrous mask, the way, um, the way Captain Victories did uh, at the beginning of this tale, uh, last issue. The big theory around this guy is that he's Orion, that Orion somehow escaped death. Even, th even though in the previous issue, you know, people talk about, you know, his father being dead, believing his father's dead, but that um, Orion had fucked up in some way. Again, the apocalypse won the war. Orion fucked up and, and, and worst of all, he somehow survived. He somehow survived, uh, this, that this, you know, massive fuck up that he probably blamed on himself. And now he is punishing himself by finding 
It's finding some spot and finding some finding some way to die in some kind of war, a war that is echoing the very war that he fought and lost. And uh, Captain Victory is is you know an ep- serves as an epilogue to New Gods, and this is you know the epilogue to the epilogue. This is um, this is Orion's personal epilogue to this this war he spent his life fighting he's and this is this is how he's gonna get himself out of it it there is another theory that argus flane is um is mr miracle and and he does you know with that bushy hair he does look a lot like high father and so you know maybe scott free grew up to look like his father and things and and the name argus flane you know has like references you know to like you know, the, the son of a god or whatever. And he, you know, but I mean, the, that that son of God thing could equally apply to Orion. And and just sort of symbolically having this this uh, helmet of hair that surrounds his face, you know, kind of, you know, echoes Darkseid's helmet in a bit too. So, I mean, I don't, I don't buy into the, uh, the theory that, that this is a sort of post-disaster, post-apocalyptic, Scott free. I mean, it could be, but I, I just don't personally buy it. But but I, I do kind of buy that this is Orion. Again, not uh, not 100%, but, but I, I do kind of buy that this is Orion. Moments later, Captain Flane canceled the force field around our perimeter. Victory is sacrifice. Sacrifice is continuity. You go on, kid. And if you do, I do. Continuity is tribulation. How true, how true. The Meccanos won't like learning about the force field. And Meccanos, I mean, this is this is part of Jack Kirby's ongoing sci-fi epic that he's been working on for the entirety of his career. And, you know, Meccanos, they were referred to in a comic from like the very beginning of Jack's career. They were in, Meccanos with that spelling were in, you know, some of Jack Kirby's earliest comics. And here they are in, in one of his last it's held them at bay all these years, changed their world and way of life, and now there is no force field. So the one thing keeping them <laughs> keeping them out is finally down. But the secret was already known. The Meccanos were moving in to bring Captain Flane his permanent rest. I shall never be certain that Captain Flane had achieved his soldier's death. However, I visualized and dramatized it in my thoughts to this day. Come in, guys. Guess this showdown's been a long time coming. Great, great panel there. You know, brutal. No doubt there was a shootout. Tech weapons, noisy and active and deadly. And in view of the odds, death's final word, forever lost in the silence of eternity. It was all so sad and strange. Captain Flame, given 50 chances at continued life, had come so far to see it terminated. Or perhaps, perhaps, no, I felt this was as the Captain's saga should proceed. He'd found the proper end to his life, and I found Ranger Center. Also, uh, a, a nice thing here, if, if Captain Flame is Orion, if he is um, Captain Victory's son, uh, you know, he never got a chance Captain Victory didn't know his own name, but then here is whatever name Captain Victory had prior to this was probably given to him by, you know, Black Mass. And so we don't know what name. So uh, we don't know what name Orion had given him or would have given him, but Orion gets to name his son, you know, at, at, at the end of it all. He, he names his son Captain Victory, a name that that means something to him and that, that you know, is going to make his son into this, like, you know, gleaming, glorious... Uh, primary colored superhero, uh, this name to sort of you know sail throughout the cosmos and 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 be the be the standard bearer for everything that uh, that Orion values. The story ends many years later in section fifty one of the Dreadnought Tiger, a tearjerker. I knew you'd bop us with one of those. Well, I can't help that. Do you cosmics want me to throw in a few gags? So uh, we had this like very dark story. Uh, and, and a pretty dark relationship between this father and son. I mean, uh, um, you know, Captain Victory had a lot of contempt for what uh, Argus Flane was doing, but, but you know, grew to have, you know, like a love and respect for him. And now we, you know, get comedy, but, you know, the sour and the sweet, you know, Shakespearean. So the legend of ultimates is true. You're an ultimate, one of the so-called gods. Wow, believe it. As a telepath, I'll vouch for him. And as a genuine PFC, private first class, just like Jack Kirby, Aboard this galactic craft, 
I'd advise against bugging the captain any further. Hey, you know, that kind of tugged at my heartstrings. And I forgot to mention when Captain Victory and Two Ray close off that universe, close off Quadrant X uh, from, from time and space, that also explains why, um, you know, Orion and his adventures take on Earth take place in the 1970s and Captain Victory's uh, take place during the 80s, which there seems to be a contradiction there, but know that Captain Victory's universe was actually, you know, completely cut off in time and space from our universe. So, you know, he could have been born in, you know, 2030 or whatever, but like once his universe is cut loose from the normal time stream of our universe, he could travel from that universe to here and it's, you know, 1920 or the 1980s or the 1970s, whatever. So, so um, that kind of, that explains that in, in case you don't believe that this is, um, you know, a continuation of the New God story. And I, I mean, the, the sense that I get from the way Jack Kirby created, you know, the New Gods and, and stuff and the boom tubes that they'd have to travel with uh, and, and even in Thor, I, I get the impression that that probably that was, was was even true in those books that that Asgard was cut off from the time stream here, and and that that New Genesis was cut off from the time stream here, um, which which also kind of explains why the Forever People and stuff would would um, you know refer to stuff like ancient vaudeville and things like that 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 like our our time space continuum and their space time space continuum don't quite line up with each other. It's it's a nonlinear relationship. So um, you you can you can travel through time and space through those boom tubes. But again, you know, that's that's some deep nerd stuff. Are you still playing Ranger Egghead? Yeah, what's a PFC? A peculiar flea carrier? Except for all those who occupy this ship's brig, our personnel demand respect from each of our guests. Let us share and care, we in our military manner and you in regard for our necessity to maintain order. There's a problem in engineering section, PFC. Follow me. Yes, sir, Captain Sir. How I love this stuff. Oh, egghead. <laughs> so they're uh, giving, giving him a Bronx cheer. Coming next, the unbelievable. So there you have it. Jack Kirby's epilogue to the new gods. Could not ask for better. Um, and, and as a treat, Captain Victory's origin story continues next issue, and 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 it too is a is a pretty wonderful comic. I'm Tom Sholey, author of Jack Kirby: The Epic Life of the King of Comics. I am Stan, a graphic biography of the legendary Stan Lee, and Jack Kirby's Star Warriors: The Adventures of Adam Star and the Solar Legion. I'm also the author of Witchman, a new superhero comic book which recently had a successful Kickstarter campaign. I'll see you next time for New God Sunday School.